It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mark Smith, who is the Elena Professor of Old Testament Literature and Exegesis at Princeton Theological Seminary. After obtaining master's degrees from Catholic University of America, Harvard University, and Yale, he earned a PhD at Yale, and he taught Hebrew Bible and Ancient Near Eastern Studies at New York University. He also taught at St. Joseph's University, a Jesuit university in Pennsylvania. He is a Roman Catholic layman. He has also served as a visiting professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome and at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Dr. Smith specializes in Israel, Israelite religion and the Hebrew Bible, as well as the literature and religion of the late Bronze Age Ugarit. He is the author of 15 books and more than 100 articles. My favorite is The Early History of God. It's not funny, it's a really good book. The book is basically about how monotheism developed. And I'd like to quote um, the person who did a review of this book for the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, because I think he captured um, the beauty of his written work. It says, it is rare to find a book so steeped in the primary evidence of texts and history and so thoroughly conversant with the nuances of recent scholarly discussion. Dr. Smith's admirable erudition and discerning judgment will make this book required reading for present and future generations of biblical scholars and students. That was said back in 2002, and it is true today. So I give you uh, Dr. Mark Smith. Good evening. Good evening. Good congregation. <laughs> we, we talk about that at Princeton Seminary. I'm one of two Roman Catholics teaching at Princeton Theological Seminary, which is a traditionally Presbyterian seminary. And uh, we've got a great broad band of uh, Protestant denominations well represented at the seminary. Um, it's it's remarkable. I'd, I'd never been in an environment where Catholics were such in a minority. It's remarkable. And it's interesting. Um, I'm awfully grateful to you that you've come out tonight and take the time out of your busy schedules. People work hard and it uh, means a lot to me. And I just want you to know that before I start. Um, a couple of preliminaries. Um, one is, first of, of course, that I want to thank uh, the school here for the invitation here, uh, especially Ron Rollheiser, Father Rollheiser, and Victoria Luna for helping to arrange everything for me. Um, it means a lot to me. I know people work hard to put these things on. Um, the other thing I want to say is I'd like to give you just a... a you know, you have the you, you hear you hear things on a curriculum vitae and all that, and and that's it's not unimportant. People work hard to polish those babies up, but uh, but what I would really like you to know that's not on the CV is where my interest in the Psalms comes from. Um, I'm 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 I say this proudly. I'm I'm the son of two PhDs. Uh, my mother and father met at Catholic University in Washington. They both earned PhDs and then proceeded to have nine children. <laughs> but my, mo but my, mother, my mother had a wonderful 40-year career also working, very hard worker at, at a time when perhaps not so many women were doing that at the time. Some were, but uh, these, these were, these were Depression-era both oldest children in German-American families. So I just want you to know, whatever you thought about that CV, you just multiply that by two and you get my parents. 
Now, one of the things that my parents did, which is to get to the point after all, is that they sent me, so I went to Blessed Sacrament uh, grade school in, in Washington, D.C. They sent me and my brothers to St. Anselm's Abbey. St. Anselm's Abbey is a Benedictine school over by Catholic University. And as a child, I would say, well, from where I'm standing now, I was a child, I used to attend noonday office and chant the Psalms with the monks. And that is my introduction to the Psalms as a child. Um, so some of this comes to you with a certain Benedictine sensibility, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, it, if I hadn't gone to St. Anselm's, I'm sure that I would never have been able to do what I do today because it really lifted my game into a different universe intellectually and academically. The, I would mention, I, I'd like to mention to you a book that people often ask me, so I, rather than, than waiting till someone asks me, I thought I'd put it at the head of my remarks, is I'm often asked, well, what's a really good book for me to read about the Psalms that's accessible and I can profit from? And the book that comes to mind, I'm going to tell you about two books tonight. And the first one is a book by a uh, Benedictine sister named Irene Noel, N-O-W-E-L-L, -L, Irene Noel. And Irene Noel is a member of uh, the Benedictine community in Atchison, Kansas. And she and I were graduate students together at Catholic University. And uh, she wrote a beautiful book. And the book is called Pleading, Cursing, Praising. So that's the main title. Pleading, Cursing, Praising, semicolon, Conversing with God Through the Psalms. It was published by Liturgical Press in 2013. And I'm sure you can find it in a lot of play venues uh, online. Uh, I use this as a course book for my Psalms course at, um, at Princeton Theological Seminary because I think that Princeton Theological Seminary students ought to learn from Catholics about the Psalms. <laughs> there are these small perverse moments of, of, of pleasure being a Catholic teaching there. I was asked to preach I know I'm getting a little off topic. I was asked to preach, and you, you choose your biblical passage. What I choose? Sure, I picked it right from Ecclesiasticus. <laughs> it may not be in their Bible, but it's in mine. <laughs> you got to take them where you can get them. Okay. <laughs> so all that by way of background. Let me, let me lay out for you. What I want to tell you are my four main points. And I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to give you these four points, and then I'm going to walk our way through them after I give them to you. And I want you to understand them as cumulative. They're not separate departments or something like that, but they're cumulative in nature. The first point I'm going to make is that words body language and sacrifices in ancient Israel, and I'll get on to specifically the temple a little bit later, these three, words, body language, and sacrifices are all three dimensions of a single communication system. Do I need to say that again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Words, body language, and sacrifices are three interrelated dimensions of a single communication system. So hold, you hold that thought. The second point that is related has to do with ritual. Ritual often draws on the forms. Don't worry, I'll have to repeat this again. I know, I know. Ritual often draws on the forms of common social activity between people, and it reframes them with a religious perspective, often in a kind of ritual context. So let me, let me that sounded awfully 
vague and abstract. But ritual actions, things that we do, even in mass, what are, what are your, the two greatest body language expressions in mass? What do you do? Kneel and stand. So where do, where do these things come from? So we're going to talk about that tonight. So they come out of, at, within the Bible anyway, they come out of known kinds of action or behavior that's not religious. People do these things in context other than the temple. So what I'm suggesting is that words and also body language, I just, we just touched on body language, and even sacrifices draw on common social activity that goes on between people, and then it, it's drawing on it, and then it puts it in a new frame. And that frame is the religious experience that, that we have in a religious setting, such as the temple. Okay? Anybody asleep yet? Okay, almost. Number three. The temple, this will, may sound a little more familiar. The temple is the central site for the performance, ritual performance of words, body, and sacrifices. And we're going to talk about what I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the conceptual model that is informing what the temple is about. And it's something that, in some respects, you already know something about. And I'll be ex explicating that. So the temple is the setting for how this communication system works. Now, temples weren't the only place in ancient Israel. There are other shrines in ancient Israel. Um, and, but the temple is the one we probably know the most about, and it's the one that seems to be the most that's connected to the Psalms. My fourth and final main point is that words, body language, and sacrifices involve bodies, people with their bodies doing things, saying things, performing, and presenting things, sacrifices. And this notion, of course, is to state the obvious. But there's another body involved that's part of this communication system, and that's God's body. And one of the, the last point I'll try to be getting to toward the end of, of this evening is to talk about, well, what is this concept of God's body in the temple? And to really confuse you at the outset, I'm going to be suggesting that in, in the Old Testament, and believe me, I don't write them, I just read them, okay? <laughs> is that there, that there are three types of bodies that God is described with in the Old Testament. And I'll, I'll be telling you a little bit about that when we, when we get down the road a little bit. So those are my four main points, okay? Now let's start in with the handout that I hope that you have in front of you. Um, you're going to see on this handout quite a bit about postures and gestures, words, music, sacrifices. You see all that on the first page. And before we get into that too deeply, I would like to just mention that this is only a selection of all of these matters. It's hardly comprehensive. I've selected them primarily for how prominent they are in the Psalms and how prominent they are in temple worship. But many of these things, some of these things, of course, occur outside of temple worship. And this is hardly a comprehensive list. And so I thought I'd bring to your attention a second book, which I picked up not so long ago, and which is, and I, I'm going to I'll tell you what it is called in a second. It's an accessible compendium collection of uh, body imagery in the Bible and, and what he calls nonverbal communication. 
So this is sort of what I'm referring to by body language. So the book is by a scholar. It's quite accessible. I don't think it even, I, it probably costs a little more than Irene Knowles' book, but not much. I don't think you can get a two-for-one offer out there, but. This book is by a man named John A. Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S, John Davies. The book is called Lift Up Your Heads. Now, this is a reference to the gates. Uh, lift, up your, lift up your heads, O gates. It's from Psalm 24. I actually thought that was kind of a curious title to choose because it's not about human body language. It's a metaphor for these gates. Uh, but that's okay. It's, it's not bad. I mean, I like snappier titles like Early History of God. I mean, I like that a lot. Um, but anyway, the subtitle of this is Nonverbal Communication and Related Body Imagery in the Bible. And it's very handy. It's very useful. And if you are interested in this topic, uh, tonight's topic, you'll find this to be a, a very good uh, complement and, uh, and aid to looking at this topic. All right. So let's turn to this handout you have in front of you. And I thought that what I would do just quickly is first talk about words. And the reason I talk about words is two, there are two reasons. The first is my sense is, of course, that the Psalms are primarily words. And whatever we know about the rest of what's going on in the Psalms, it's mediated through their words. So whatever we know about sacrifices in the Psalms per se, I'm just talking about the Psalms so far, We've got a couple of scripture scholars out here I've got to be careful about, you see. And uh, the, the, uh, whatever we know about body language in, this, in the context of worship, an awful lot of it comes through the words of the book of Psalms. So our starting point and our end point ultimately are words. Okay. The second reason is what I learned from talking to uh, my students. And what I sense from my students is, you like to start with where they, they, what they know best, what they're most comfortable with. And what they know are the words. You know, they've memorized a lot of texts. I love my Princeton Seminary students. These, these people, can, they can cite chapter and verse. It's, it's really remarkable. It's, it's, really, it's really a pleasure, actually. You have these students who are just thirsting for scripture. You know, they've studied it since they were kids. I never did that. I didn't read the Bible hardly till I was in college, you know. It's remarkable what they know. So we're going to start with words, and I, perhaps that it may or may not be also what you know best about the Psalms. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit later. Um, I will mention other parts of the Bible, but our focus will be on the Psalms. So under words, you're going to see under words, I've listed, I, this, is, this is my my study of psalms made simple in terms of so-called types of psalms. Uh, so, scholars who work on psalms have very complicated schemes of, of, of what the psalms, how do, you, how do you, you know, divide them up or categorize them and so on. And I have a very stripped down version of all this. And it basically divides into two big categories. You've got prayer, which is what you do when you want something, and you've got praise, which is when you got it. Didn't that sound scientific? <laughs> so prayer, under prayer, I've got three categories. One, of course, is prayer itself in its simplest form, which is basically calling on God, O oh Lord, and making a request. That's prayer at its simplest. And you can pray for yourself or you can pray for someone else. Our shortest prayer in the Bible is a prayer that Moses actually prays on behalf of Miriam, in which he says, El na rafanala. God, please heal her, please. It's five words in Hebrew. It's a basic prayer. He invokes God. He calls on God. God, comma, heal her, please. Now, psalms of trust basically build on prayer. And this is often 
involves you also invoke God, O Lord, plus you have a request, plus there's an expression of trust. So you have this sense with this expression of trust that things are pretty good. Oh, you're okay, even though there's some threat out there, but you're trusting in God. Even though my foes are arrayed around me, I know you are with me. Even Psalm 23 is really, is really a psalm of trust. Even though I go through the valley of death, you are with me. It's an expression of trust. And may I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. There's the prayer. There's the request. Laments are very common in the Psalms. It involves an invocation of God, plus a request, plus a complaint, usually about one situation. And in the book of Psalms, laments are the most common or the most common uh, psalm type that we have. And you know why? Because people know how to complain. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but I've heard that from people, that they know how to complain. And uh, it, it's, the psalms are where people live, so why not? And life was very threatening in the ancient world. I mean, it is today, too. But it was really, I mean, when you think about the number of women who died in childbirth, the number of children who died in childbirth, I mean, just sickness and illness and warfare. It was just a terribly chaotic, uncertain world for people. And we need to recognize that in, in these, these laments. And we need to do it because there's a lot of people around us who also have very threatened lives. And they, they need for us to hear their voices too. So reading laments in the Psalms is good training, not just to help us, but to help us learn how to hear other people. All right, let's move to praise. Praise, we sort of jump over to another category in which, as I scientifically said, Praise is when you've got and you want to respond to that. People expressing basic gratitude for receiving whatever it was they were requesting. So psalms of thanksgiving, uh, invocation of the deity, usually, plus an expression of thanks for something which the speaker wanted and now has. And sometimes we'll even quote the lament that they, they had before. They'll say, I called out to you and you answered me. See. So there's an intrinsic relationship between lament and thanksgiving in, in many psalms. And that's the balance of life, the movement between lament and thanksgiving. It, it's, it's part of what gives us hope when we're lamenting. And it's what deepens our gratitude to God that we can remember that we were lamenting. Hymns. And hymns involve praise of the deity. Uh, we're very familiar with hymns. We sing them all the time in church. They're commonly, they're, they're a little bit different, though, from what we've seen so far because they don't always invoke God. Hymns are actually addressed to everyone besides God. I mean, some hymns invoke God also. I'm not going to say that you don't have that element sometimes in a psalm. You do. But hymns are really inviting others in to join in that praise of God. All you nations, clap your hands, shout to God with cries of gladness. You could call on the angels to join you in praise. You can call on the sun and the moon and the stars to join in praise. It's all in the Psalms. You can call on your congregation right here in front of you. Praise God. Praise God. Whenever we say hallelujah or alleluia, that's exactly what we're doing. Hallelujah, or, or in Greek, the alleluia, is literally praise Yah, the short form of the divine name. Every time you say hallelujah, you're speaking good Hebrew. 
Praise, then, is commonly in the community. Often when we have prayers, psalms of trust and lament, it's often the individual. And what hymns are doing, and even psalms of thanksgiving, they're bringing that individual back into the community context. And so there's a kind of social human element that comes with praise. That praise is not only that you think God heard your prayer, but your community also recognizes with you and shares that with you. And so you, you know it from, in a sense, both the commun human community and from God. Finally, psalms of instruction. Uh, these are psalms which are a form of praise. They are addressed to the community, as with, these, with hymns. But they are also, they're, they're, they're sometimes regarded as teaching psalms. That is, that you're teaching the community about God. But it's an indirect form of praise. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Almost sounds like a hymn, doesn't it? It's instructional. See, so hymns and, hymns and psalms of instruction, sometimes people call these wisdom psalms. Some of them do have a lot of wisdom language in them, but these are really a form of praise ultimately to God. So those are our basic categories that we're going to be working with. Now let's turn to our second category, which is body language. This is back up at the top of the page. And I wanted to suggest that these are things that you'll also recognize. I mean, a lot of the forms, the words, you're familiar with a lot of these forms, prayer and trust and lament and thanksgiving and hymns. Um, these are all forms or types that you're familiar with. And in a way, the body language applies as well. So let's just go through a few of these things. One of my own personal favorites, for, so we'll start with postures, dancing. Here, here's, a piece of, here's a piece of liturgy we've only begun to um, really fully integrate in the modern context. This is not something that we've done um, as fully as we might, but dancing is mentioned in the Psalms. Um, I've always loved the line from Psalm 30, verse 11, you have turned my mourning into dancing. He could have just said, you've turned my mourning into joy. And it would have, in a sense, made the same thing because body language is parallel to the words. Remember, I said there are three interrelated dimensions of a single communication system. So body language expresses what we could also put in terms of words like joy. But this is very poetic and it's very beautiful. And dancing is considered to be, after all, People like to dance, don't they? How many people like to dance? Wow, we almost have a majority here. All right. But why do we like to dance? We like to dance because we feel free and energetic. Now, liturgically, we've got to think about body language. Is that When we do certain body language, it isn't only to express what we feel. It's also because when we undertake that body language, it helps us feel that way. It's not only expressive, it makes us feel that way. It informs who we are. We become what we feel when we choose to dance. We feel energetic, expressive. Our body language is exploding comparing to its opposite in the Psalms. which expresses the opposite. I'm not free when I'm sitting in the dust in lamentation. My lamentation has overwhelmed me. My body language not only says it, it makes me feel that way. That's the way human beings work. We often think of these things as being only expressive of the way we feel. But what we do with those feelings and how we express them make us feel that way more. And knowing that is helpful for us 
when we pray and we think about what we're really asking from God when we pray. That we're not slaves always to our emotions, and yet we know our emotions are important as we try to move forward with God. So dancing. Standing is a very common uh, kind of body language. We stand at mass. Standing is for, in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of station of attention. It is in the Bible, those who stand are sometimes attendants of the king. Literally, to stand is to be in attendance before a uh, superior figure, politically, often. Um, uh, my own favorite story, I mean, this is not everybody's Bible reading list, is Judges chapter 3. This is a story of how our hero named Ehud is going to stick a, his blade into the enemy king named Eglon, whose name means calf. He's like a fatted calf for the slaughter. And his servants, who are going to go out before, just before Ehud is going to pull his sword out with his left hand, he's a lefty, which is what catches the king off guard. I approve. I am left-handed. Never had a left-handed desk as a kid. <laughs> Gosh, I need therapy. Okay. Um, so the attendants of King Eglon, they are those who stand before the king. It is the posture, it is the posture of proper attendance. The Queen of Sheba says to, for, it, to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 8, Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. They are, they are lucky, she's saying, for them to be your attendants, those who stand before you. So it's a posture of attention before another. And there are lots of examples in the Old Testament. Sitting in the dust. Now, sitting in the dust... For, especially for individual lamentation. It expresses sadness. This could be either individual or communal. You may recall the Psalm 137. You know, my students at Princeton Seminary, they just start, if I say the number, they start quoting it at me. It's, it's amazing. Amazing grace. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. Also we wept as we thought of Zion. And they're sitting in lamentation. And our captors asked us to sing a song of Zion. How could we sing in a foreign land? Sitting. Or the opening of the book of Lamentations. It's a picture of personified Jerusalem. She's depicted as a queen. Echa yashva vadar ha'ir. How lonely sits the city the great one of the people. She has become a widow, the great one among the nations. So she's sitting in the dust, the opening image, if you view lamentation, then they don't have to tell you. Oh, she's sitting in the dust. All you have to do is, she is, if she's sitting like that, she's not enthroned when you're sitting alone. You're not enthroned when you're sitting alone. I kind of like that ring of that. I just made that up. It happens. So lamentation, sitting in the dust, a number of things go with it. You can tear your hair out, rip your clothing, sit in the dust. And really, the paradigm expression of lamentation is death over the, lamenting the death of someone who's, who is close, you're close to. That's the paradigm. And we have other lament kinds of experiences being depicted, of course, but the basic model, the most basic life experience where lament is really there is the death of a loved one. And anybody in this room who's lost someone you've loved, you know what I'm talking about. I just gave a talk at a synagogue last weekend, and um, I, gave, I gave a little talk on the lament of 
David over um, King Saul and his son Jonathan. Now, you may remember that David and, and Jonathan were very close. It's a beautiful lament. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. But the line that always gets me is where David at the end says, your love for me was, and then he goes on to say something along the lines of, was, was more wonderful than the love of women. Now, I don't know about the last part, but the first part is what gets me, is that usually, usually, you know, when I hear people talk about, you know, I love them so much, they lost someone, I love them so much, David is coming to a realization, something that he's hardly ever noticed, that Jonathan loved him more. Your love for me, not my love for you. Your love for me. David has finally understood what Jonathan and life meant to him now that he's dead. It's, it's extremely powerful. Death is the paradigm experience. And more than the paradigm experience, lament is also a kind of act that is the physical act of going through traditional lamentation behavior, body language, is actually an imitation of what the dead have gone through in dying. Now, we may not recognize that immediately because it may not be quite our idiom, but it was their idiom. To tear the clothing is to imitate the violence that the dead have gone through when they've died. It's an, a form of imitation. It's mimetic. Sitting in the dust is like going down to the underworld. Because that, you know, that's, that's the direction in which it is, and that's what it is. The underworld is dust, according to the Psalms. The passage that beautifully illustrates this is the story of, of uh, Jacob in the book of Genesis. He believes that his son Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. His, the brothers have brought back his tunic, his beautiful tunic that his father has given him. And it is dipped in animal blood. And they just show it to him. And he draws the conclusion that they want him to draw. So what's his response? So this is a quote. Jacob tore his clothing put sackcloth on his loins and observed mourning for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, saying, No, I will go down in mourning to my son in Sheol. And so his father wept for him. The experience, the experience of being in lamentation over death is so overwhelming, in a sense, you feel like you are dying. Okay. The last posture I, I want to talk about is sometimes called prostration. This is basically a fancy schmancy word for bowing down, either bowing down uh, part way or even to your face to the ground or maybe your whole body to the ground. Its basic point is to express homage. And it could be submission, reverence, awe, or fear. But in a way, it's an obvious point, if you think about it for just a moment. That is, all you're doing physically, if you bow down to someone else, what are you explicitly doing to someone else? You're literally raising them above you. You're expressing that you are physically below them. I do that in class for students. They think that's great. <laughs> I'll spare you. So Joseph's brothers, when they, they come to Egypt, they bow down before their brother. They don't know it's, it's Joseph, their brother, yet. When Jacob meets up with Esau, and things, Jacob's a little worried about Esau. He thinks Esau still might want to kill him. I've got two brothers. I understand what that's about. No, I got, they're both great brothers. We're going to do a brother's weekend this, this month, so I guess we're not hating each other too much. 
Well, you know, it really helped to have like two and three sisters be be between us on either side. So, you know, we had a buffer zone there. Jacob bows down before Esau seven times when he meets him after he's come back from Aram and his father-in-law Laban seven times. And this, of course, translates into religious language. So in Psalm 5, verse 6, don't worry, you don't have to know all these references for the quiz later. Yet I, Psalm 5 says, Yet I, in your great covenant love, I bow down in awe of you at your holy temple. So what you do in the human realm also works in the divine realm or with God. That relationship between what you do in common social activity is the model, largely the model, for what you're doing in the religious sphere. Okay, let's move to gestures. The removal of footwear, which has become now quite popular in the United States when you visit someone's home, but not very traditional here. When Moses, Moses is at the burning bush, and of course, what's one of the things that he does? God tells him, remove your sandals for the ground on which you are standing is holy well, ground so this is something that islam understands very well uh that is something is is a interesting uh concrete expression of a very nice biblical expression there um hands to express invocation so basic i should say removal of footwear then is a rec recognition of the holy space we might say you know, he didn't have to say. He didn't. You know, he didn't have to come in to come in, come there and say. Uh, he could have just told him to remove his footwear, and Moses or the people, or the audience might have gotten the point. But they, he spells it out for you that it's holy ground. Hands for expressing invocation. Now, I always like this because if you've ever taught second grade, anybody teach second grade or third grader? So you ask a question in class. Watch those hands shoot up. Oh, 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 I know the answer. Yes, that's very, I'm glad you know the answer. That's great. It is, it's basically hands are designed to get the attention. And it's the equivalent or it's parallel to invoking God. So I was suggesting words and gestures go together. So Psalm 28 Verse 2, listen to my plea for mercy when I cry to you, when I lift my hands toward the holy of holies, literally the devere of your holy place. When I lift my hands, I cry to you, listen to my plea for mercy. It's a kind of invocation of God. Washing hands to express innocence. Psalm 26, verse 6, I wash my hands in innocence. And I walk around your altar, O Lord. Kissing to express loyalty. Uh, kissing is for a lot of things in the Bible. A lot of really good things. Um, but it includes, but it's, it's very common. It's very common for family relations to kiss. Uh, men, kissing men, very common in, in uh, the Old Testament. Um, it's also used for expressing loyalty uh, to an overlord. My, uh, there's this whole thing in Psalm 2 about kissing the feet. Well, that's expressive. And finally, on this particular list, which I could have had other things, hiding the face to express fear of the divine presence. Now, face is a very complex uh, body part for both people and for God. We'll get to that a little bit later, but just the basic here, Exodus 3, 6, Moses hid his face. Here we are back at the burning bush scene again. Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an expression of recognition of the divine presence. There's also a kind of popular view in the Bible that seeing the face of God, it's not that it's impossible. I've often been told by people, oh, you can't see the face of God in the Bible. It may be inadvisable, but it's not impossible. It's for the righteous. It's for the righteous. Um, I mean, come on, you all know, you saw Indiana Jones, didn't you? 
so-called high priest scene, I have to tell you, I laughed so hard. You want to know why? Because the guy's got the archaeologist, he's got the high priest stuff on. You know the prayer that he recites? It's like a medieval Aramaic prayer. It's not even biblical. And four of us are like laughing in the movie theater, and all these people are looking at us like, what's with you? <laughs> Occupational hazard. Okay. Yes. Okay, so gestures. Let's move to, um, I'd like to turn basically um, to, I, I could talk about music, but let me talk about sacrifices, because sacrifices are a third parallel element within this communication system. You've already begun to get the hang of my argument or my general drift of thought that postures and gestures may parallel uh, actual words. That, that body language is a language. It has a kind of content to it, me, content that expresses a certain meaning, which are also captured in words, so that they are parallel. And sometimes they're used together in parallelism in biblical texts. And there's a sense in which sacrifices are a further dimension of this system. Um, and the information here, now we have, to, for some of this information, we, gotta, we can get some of this information out of the Psalms, but we're very much aided also by the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus is, if I'm correct, I think that Leviticus is probably the favorite book of most people here tonight, is that right? It's a great book. It is. Come on, it is. It's part of scripture. All right. So the names of the sacrifices, so I'm just gonna give you a little taste of why I think they're so important, is that they express a further dimension. And they're kind of an indirect, they're kind of an indirect form within this communication system. It's like, it's sort of like visiting family. Why is that? Well, however you're feeling about family, you'll, you, you, you might accidentally express it in words, or hopefully you, if it's good stuff, you express it in words, and you're going to express that with body language, right? But you also might bring a gift. You know, you might bring a gift to either express that relationship or maybe even to repair that relationship. That's what sacrifices are. They're, they're an indirect part of that communication. So the offering down there, now it's time for your Hebrew lesson. Under sacrifices, the first offering is called an olah. Olah literally means what goes up. That's all it really means. And what it is is that it's an offering that it completely goes up in smoke. It's completely burned. It's a complete burnt offering. It's often translated burnt offering, but that's not correct. Every good biblical translation should translate it as upper. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. But that's what it means. And so when the offering, when, when Noah wants to get God's attention after the flood, he offers an olah. It goes up. And it's a little anthropomorphic. It's a little human sounding. God, it goes up. <laughs> God smells the offering, God shows up. Well, God knows what barbecue smells like in the neighborhood. <laughs> well, you laugh. You know why God likes Abel's offering more than Cain's? It's meat. <laughs> and everybody knows that God likes a meat offering more than vegetables. You know why? Because Leviticus says it's, it's, it's the slogan. It should be the slogan for Weight Watchers. Kol chalev ladonai, all fat belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It's all in the Bible. <laughs> you just have to notice it. I've always liked that. Okay, so the Ola is like saying, O oh Lord, or it's like putting my hands up. These are three parallel actions which express a similar way of trying to get God's attention. Oh, Lord. The second offering is called a mincha in Hebrew. I'm missing some. Uh, I'm, this come through? In the, uh, no, the handout's not so good. Okay. 
Uh, there's some pointing missing somehow. I don't know why. But mincha, it literally means tribute. Now, we use tribute uh, very rarely, which I'm very grateful for. Because where tribute, I mean, we say, we, you know, they had this tribute show on TV where a bunch of people showed up and paid tribute to someone. Okay, it's a metaphorical usage of the term. It's the gift that you give to your overlord king. Well, I'm grateful we don't have kings in this country and that we do not have to do this as a, as a because it's, it performs our submission. Now, when it comes to God, I do not mind so much. The mincha is literally, in the Bible, what someone brings to a king. And it's, it's parallel to bowing down. It's parallel to the body language of bowing down, or it's parallel to a sort of statement you could get in the Psalms where you say, you are above me and there is no other, Psalm 16. So it's yet a different way of expressing that kind of attitude toward God. So it's like a prayer. Sacrifices are like a prayer. Oh, Lord, I recognize that you are my king. You are my overlord. That's what bringing a mincha means. And the next thing you want to say in this prayer of sacrifices is shalamim, which is the word you know, or related to the word that you know, shalom. Shalom. Peace. Wholeness. Well-being. It's a way of expressing, I wish to be at peace whole and well with my overlord. It's a kind of a greeting gift that is expressing my aspiration for this relationship. And the flip side of that is the chatat offering. It's, it comes from a word for sin. I don't think it's an offering that you say, okay, now I get to sin some more. It's the unsin offering. You want to express getting rid of sin. And it's sometimes tied to the asham offering, which is an expression of guilt. Now, these are all the kind of things that you can find in the ancient record, in the Bible and outside of the Bible, of things that you would say or perform before a king. And I want to put that thought in your minds, because it's going to play out very nicely. Okay. Now... That's our communication system. You've been very patient, and we'll, I'll try to move a little bit more quickly through these other three points. I've already mentioned that ritual takes the forms of common social activity among people and reframes them with a religious perspective in a religious performance. And you've already gotten sort of an inkling of that. If I bow down before the king, and I take that and put that in a religious context before God. It's my way of saying, oh, God, you are my, my king. So we can take what are well-known idioms that we have, that we know, that we've been using, in a sense, in church our whole lives, and we recognize that the ritual of the Mass and other rituals take forms of common social activity or action that people have, but it puts them, reframes them, with a religious perspective. Now this religious perspective, as we're about to see when we get to the temple, is in terms of what I'm gonna call scripted performance. Boy, that sounds fancy schmancy, doesn't it? Scripted performance. Now you already know this. If you come to a lecture, you know that you're gonna come in, and you're gonna sit down, and you expect someone to introduce the speaker, Speaker gets up, speaker gives the talk, speaker stops yakking, then it's time for, so you know the script. You know the script for, for a multitude of activities that you do that are not religious at all. If you go to a faculty meeting, I, I, was, I go to a lot of faculty meetings, Presbyterians tell me that the most authentically Presbyterian thing we do at Princeton Seminary is hold meetings. 
I told them it's proof of the existence of purgatory. <laughs> they did not disagree. <laughs> it's going to be a slow conversion, but by the time I retire, So scripted activity is something we do all the time. And we know we do it all the time. We just don't think of it that way. We don't think of them being scripts, but we're, we are socialized. You play a game. If you don't follow the script, it doesn't work. If I'm playing football and all of a sudden I whip out a baseball bat and whack the thing over the goalpost, something is not quite right. It follows a script. It's got rules. And script is really a way of talking about how the rules fit into a chain of events that people act out. We do it all the time. And that's what we do in church. And that's what they did in the temple. Going to church or going to the temple is like going to a play in which you're both the audience and the participants. I'm going to say that again. I think it's sort of stating the obvious once one thinks about it. Going to church or going to the temple in ancient Israel is a situation in which people who attend are both participants and audience. Even the priests who you say, well, they're participants, they're not audience, but they're audience too because there's somebody else who shows up, and that's God. I mean, that is ritual in the ancient world. And I've been working at this for a while. It dawned on me about 10 years ago. When you really look at the ancient record across all the different types of literature that they have, ritual is where people meet the gods and goddesses, whether it's in the Bible or not. Ritual is, and having a ritual imagination or liturgical imagination is really important. It's the, from the point of view of the Bible, in a sense, it's the real reality. It's not, just, it's not just this physical stuff. This physical stuff and everything that we can observe empirically, it's real. But it's not the only thing that's real. And it's important as Christians, I think, to have a liturgical, a ritual sense of reality. I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, not showing up just on Sunday or in ancient Israel for the three pilgrimage holidays. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all my life is a manner of speaking that I recognize God in my life and my life in God all the days of my life. I mean, one of the great things my parents did for me was drag me to 6.30 daily mass every day so that I could understand that it's something that was about every day. Do I like going to 6.30 Mass? Not always, you know, because 13-year-olds always love that kind of thing. But it's always stayed with me. Okay, so scripted performance. So you go to the temple. Let's turn to the temple. And now it's time for slides. I love pictures. Let's see. I don't know. I'm trying to move this baby. Do I point it at something in particular? It's the Uncle, Uncle Fenster move in the Adams family. Am I doing something wrong here? It wouldn't be the first time. Okay. I just want to... I'm hitting the arrow. You know, how many professors does it take to do this? Uh, What'd you do? Just hit it harder? Oh, she turned it on. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just a little background on Solomon's temple. Um, he's got, he has a uh, great relationship with the Phoenicians, according to the Bible. So not only does he have peace treaty with King Hiram, but Hiram, as part of this, he gives expertise to Solomon uh, in terms of 
uh, cedar, and, and, but also craftsmen themselves. Um, he's got masons. These are the craftsmen. The capitals on top of the columns, some people think they're sort of Phoenician influence. The stands, we're going to see cherubs. I love cherubs. Don't you like to look at cherubs? Wait till you see my cherubs. Um, also, we know about that there's a cherub throne in the Holy of Holies in the back of the temple. Cedar wood for the temple paneling. It's also given by Hiram of Tyre, whom he calls my brother. And you use brother when you're in a treaty or covenant relationship with someone who's not your, literally your brother. It's a kind of form of fictive kinship. Covenant is for rela building relationships between people who are not blood relations. Now, sometimes it can be to reinforce blood relations that aren't going well. That's what happened to Jacob and Laban in chapter 31 of Genesis. But generally, David and Jonathan, who are not related, they cut a covenant together. So that's what Hiram and Solomon have going. And that's why he calls him my brother. Notice Solomon co calls his own palace the Lebanon Forest House. That's a Phoenician. Lebanon's up in Phoenicia. OK. Um, size of the temple. Everybody know your cubits? 60 by 20 by 30. So how many, how many cubits is, how many, how many inches in a cubit? Hey, it isn't the metric system. Come on, you can do this. It's 18 inches. So think a foot and a half, so 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 45 cubits high. OK, you with me? This actually is important for later on. I'm not just you know, having fun. Lebanon Forest House is bigger. And so I want people to realize that in a way, we have these really magnificent sense of the temple. Oh, it must have been huge and wonderful and great. Well, this one's actually the, the one that Solomon himself actually builds. It's, it's almost like his large royal chapel next to his palace. It's not as big as people think of it as being. The one that's built later or rebuilt later under Herod the Great in the time of Jesus, that is a big deal by comparison. OK. Now, this is a, this is a uh, picture of the first temple. Just kidding. Um, this is a drawing or a mock-up. Uh, a friend of mine did this, uh, Victor Horowitz. I like to say his name because I miss him because he died about five years ago of heart failure. Um, and he's a smart guy, and he did interesting work, and I miss him. Anyway, as part of an article on the temple, he uh, did this drawing. And one of the things that strikes one immediately is the, the altar is outside in the courtyard, not inside. Because they do real offerings with real animals, with real sacrifice. It doesn't come in cellophane. It is bloody guts. So it's outside. You don't want that stuff inside your house, do you? I don't know. All right. Behind, everybody see where that altar is? It's big. You have to walk up it. You got to get the animals up there. So you got a little ramp going. It's big. Uh, behind it is something which in the Bible is called the Bronze Sea. It is, you can't really, it's not such a, uh, I mean, literally sea, S-E-A. And it's really huge. It's superhuman in scale. It's not just for washing hands, which is the way it's sometimes been interpreted. If it was for washing hands, those priests would be playing in the NBA. <laughs> They'd be killing the Spurs tonight. This is so hot. No, no. This is like, you'd have to be like 10 feet plus to get your hands in that baby. This is superhuman in scale. To the left and right are, um, these are stands, which are thought to have been used for offerings. And then you move into the temple proper, you've got two um, pillars. One's called Yachin, and the other's called Boaz, which is actually a prayer formula, which literally means, may he establish in strength. It's like a prayer to God. Yachin is the verb, may he establish, and Boaz, for all of you Hebrew geeks out there like me, I love Hebrew, Oz, Oz is related to Oz, meaning strength. So may he establish with strength. So the building itself is communicating prayer to God. Think about that. As you move into this outer area, you move into the central 
longer room, which is sometimes called the holy place. It is decorated. It's hard to tell from this, but it's decorated with che- cheese, cherubs and trees. I didn't even drink a dinner, and I'm doing that. <laughs> cherubs and trees. And it's, where do you know where trees and cherubs occur together elsewhere in the Bible? Can you think of any place where you know where a cherub and maybe trees are? Garden of Eden. So the temple is like the Garden of Eden. It's God's home. That's exactly right. You don't have to take the test at the end tonight. (laughs) Okay. In the very back is the Holy of Holies. And you maybe can't really see this, but there are two large cherubs that are said to form God's throne. And God is thought of as being seated on the cherubim. And in fact, one of his titles in the Bible is Yoshev Bakruvim, the one enthroned on the cherubs. So that is his cherub throne. Now, just keep all that in mind. What's the model? What's the idea? How are they think- what does the architecture say about the identity and understanding of who God is in this picture? So I've already mentioned it's got a tripartite structure. The portico is where the two pillars are, then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. It's also called the devere, the back room. Okay, we've hit all these things. The offerings are made in the courtyard. That's part of our communication system. And the basic idea is that, remember, God is the king. Remember we were talking about that before? And he's not just any old king like Solomon. He's more like a king like David. He's a warrior king. And the temple is his palace. And people who make pilgrimage and make offerings to God are are the vassals of God. So the temple expresses this relationship in political terms, common social political activity, reframed in a ritual context to express who I recognize God is. God, as the, as the book of Ecclesiasticus says, my reading to that Princeton seminary, one time I preached, God is the all. To use the language of the great warrior king is to recognize God is and does all for others. Some people, I understand, don't like violence in the Bible, don't like anger in the Bible from God. Isn't how we want to think about God sometimes. For the ancient Israelites, divine anger and, being a, and divine violence is the Israelites' way of saying, we recognize that God can and will help us when we cannot help ourselves. So one has to understand the larger context of these concepts. I'm not going into trying to... This is not about justification of concepts. It's about broadening the understanding of concepts. I often, I often face this with students, and I want them to understand it's basically saying when you're in a covenant relationship with God, God is your overlord. It means God is going to do things for you. And when that warrior goes to fight, you don't think that, that guy's jacked? He is ready. He is so hyped. It's that warrior anger You can feel it coming right off his divine body when he goes. He is ready. You know the ultimate alpha male in the Olympics? It's like if you could capture that energy, we'd solve the world energy crisis. I mean, it's amazing. And that's who God is for ancient Israel, when God is the warrior. Okay. Uh, I've already mentioned about the columns, the cherub throne. Okay, now what's going on? Why do I say superhuman size of this God in the temple? Well, you got to go back to your basic math. Well, I'm going to hold that thought for a moment. You know, every talk needs a little suspense, sort of. Let's say, here's an altar from uh, the site of Beersheba from the 8th century. This is a stone altar. It gives you size. It's pretty big. You can get an animal on there to sacrifice it, cut it up, pull the guts out. Because remember, the guts belong to God. The meat belongs to the priests and the congregation. I don't think God's getting kind of so-so deal on some of that. But, but God gets all of the olah. Remember, God already got the whole olah offering, the burnt offering. So it's not all bad. 
This is a wheeled stand. It's, this example was found on the island of Cyprus, and it seems to be like the sort of thing that we see described in 1 Kings 7, stands of bronze. I, I noticed the spelling really worked out well here. <laughs> Capitals on the columns that we have from elsewhere. This is a little snake that was found at a site in ancient Israel. We know one of these is in the temple. It's, it's a kind of an interesting piece of cultic information. Well, we won't dwell on that at the moment. Ah, uh, oh, here's my cherub. How many of you knew that this is what a cherub looks like? So this is on, yeah, a few of, yeah, okay. There's always a professor or two in the crowd. They know everything, you know. Well, they know a lot. They devoted their lives to this good stuff, and we thank God for that. Okay, so the cherub here combines. It's not like the, it's not like the cherubs. We, you know, it's not like the little baby with the little cheeks, the beautiful cheeks, and the little wingies, and the, it's so cute. It's not like that at all. This is a mixed form creature: human head, ings, eagle's wings, lion body, as if it combines all of these, and the cherub is a kind of, the mixed form is to guard between the outside and the inside of sacred space. Remember what the job of the cherub is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24? He guards the garden, the way to the garden. So this is the idea of the cherub in the temple, is guarding God's space. And not only that, God is enthroned on the cherub back in the Holy of Holies. This is another cherub, it's hard to see. This is actually a king that we know about. This is on an ivory plaque from the site of Megiddo from the 13th or 12th century. It's actually presently, it was dug by a, a team from the University of Chicago. And I, if you go to the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, I think you can see this on display. Anyway, kind of a little hard to see, but there's a human figure seating on, seated on a cherub throne. I don't know if you can make that out very well. It's a side view. Okay, sorry that slide isn't a little better. Here's another one of a Phoenician king named Hiram. It's probably a descendant of the Hiram of Solomon. It's a little, but maybe not. Anyway, side view, notice the cherub throne. You see that? So when God is seated on the cherub throne, he's like the king. He is the king. He's the ultimate king. He's the king from whom the human king gets his power. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of other temples. One is from Syria, around the 8th century, Ain Dara, 13th to 10th. Uh, this is from Tel Tainat. This is the 8th century temple. It's got these lion bases for pillars in the front. It's divided into three main sections, like Solomon's temple. Here's a drawing of it. Outer area, portico, long room in the middle, holy of holies with elevated area in the back, just like Solomon's temple. Here's the lion bases. This was excavated in Syria. This is the site of Ain Dara. Um, it's northwest of Aleppo. And I must say, I'm totally brokenhearted about this site. Some of you seem to know what I'm talking about. This site, 60% of this site was destroyed in airstrikes uh, in the war. And um, it's gone forever. Palmyra, gone for, uh, it's just, it's just heartbreaking. I mean, could you, could you imagine if, you know, I don't know what, you, you know, what strikes you. What if the Alamo was obliterated and you never could see it again? I mean, if that's a sim an important symbol for you. Or the White House. Could you imagine? It's heartbreaking for those of us who work in the ancient world. And, and it's all over Syria. Now, what's so special? This is actually a very large and elaborated version of our three-part portico, outer room, main room. The main room, in this case, it's a little more sideways by comparison, and it's large. Notice what's right above the portico. Can you see what those are? What do those look like to you? Well, I'm going to give you, this is a little comparison of what they share in common. Let's not worry about this right now. There's the picture. What are those? They're footprints. What are those footprints doing there? Yeah, you could play in the NBA. 
Now, I once did a count. These, this footprint is about one, these footprints are about one meter long. And there are four of them. Oh, well, I'll go back. I, don't, I guess I don't have all of them. There's, you can see three of them in this shot. So who might have a footprint that's about a meter long? The deity, in this case. This is, and this is, this, these footprints are a way of recognizing the deity returning to his or her temple. I mean, there's a question of whether it's for a god or a goddess. We don't know for sure. But this deity, which is just a fancy word for either a god or a goddess, this deity is probably, if you do, if you do the foot thing, and any, anybody who works at a shoe store, do we have any shoe store people here? Good, because I'm going to tell a big fat lie now. Anybody who works in a shoe store knows that that means that that figure is about 60 feet tall. That is the superhuman size God. That's the God that goes out and fights on behalf of Israel. And when God finishes fighting, God returns to his palace, which is his temple, and is seated on his cherub throne. Now, we, there's an, you say, well, that's not in the Bible. So how do you know God is so big? Higher math. How big is the cherubs? When there's, when, how high are they? They're 10 cubits high. Remember how big a cubit is? So how, how high is it where God is seated in the temple? 15 feet. Now, the chair you're sitting on, how high off the floor is it? Imagine if you were seated 15 feet up high and you were that big. Well, you maybe won't break the ceiling here, but you could give it a shot. Maybe you put your hand through it. That's how big God is in the temple. All his glory fills the world. And the superhuman body, it radiates out. So Isaiah can say in chapter 6, verse 1, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Ram Venisah, lifted up and high. He's seeing him in the Jerusalem temple, seated on his cherub throne. This is the superhuman-sized God. Now, it's not a fleshy body. It's like an energy body. But he can see it. Well, he can see it. He has prophetic vision, you might say. But there are other places. And this really gets me to this point about the face, that coming to the temple... The desire is to see the face of God. What Catholicism used to call the beatific vision, that what we hope for in heaven is a, is a wish that's already being expressed on earth in the book of Psalms. To see the face of God. To see that radiance, because God's face, this kind of body is, is like an energy field. It's like light. It's sometimes compared to the light of the sun. And to be able to behold that light would finally be to be at home with God, which is what we all aspire to ultimately. But, of course, we have a little work to do in this world before we get there. I'll stop now and thank you very much.